Well, welcome again on this uh, group of sessions on the treatment of pediatric fractures. Uh, today's subject is going to be fractures of the shoulder girdle in the pediatric patient. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover all the way from the medial clavicle all the way down to the proximal humerus. And <clears throat> down to the proximal humerus here in the metaphysis primarily. Now, Let's talk about sternoclavicular joint injuries. Are they really truly joint injuries? N not for children. No. What what kind of injuries are they? Uh, they tend to so be is this this isn't the correct term to describe these. What are they? Uh, proximal clavicle uh, fractures. Yeah, fractures. That's right. They're called fractures, injur injuries to the proximal clavicle. What's unique about this? Why do why do we see this in this age group and we don't see it in adults? That the ligaments are stronger than the metaphyseal bone there. And what else? Um, Which one of the last physes to close? Oh, the clavicle is one of the last That's right, close. that's right. It's what's unique about the anatomy of the proximal clavicle. It's really one of the last epiphyses to ossify and also to close. So there is a weakness here. It's the last one to close. And so most of the stability, as you pointed out, is really ligamentous. So uh, they're, very, they're actually, this is not a very good fitting joint. So there really isn't like the hip uh, or maybe the um, uh, elbow, it doesn't really have a lot of bony stability. And so it depends strictly on the sternoclavicular ligaments. All right. So there's a disruption of the proximal clavicle. And where does the failure occur? Where does it occur? At the epiphysis. That's right, through the physeal line. And so these are physeal injuries. They're, they go through the, the weak part, which is the physis. When we discussed, you know, children's fractures, that the physis is less resistant to shear and tension stresses than the local metaphysis. So the physis goes, so what's, what's the other parts that remain intact? The periosteum. Yeah, the periosteum remains intact. The epiphysis remains reduced. It doesn't displace. So there's not a dislocation. And so the periosteum, you just say, is intact. And then how does that affect the healing? That helps its healing potential. That's right. It serves as a source of osteogenesis. And so the periosteum here, since it's new periosteum, is very thick, and so it doesn't get torn. And so the metaphysis displaces, and that then fills in with callus. So, what's the most common mechanism of these injuries? Usually direct blow. Direct blow to where? The clavicle? No, um, well, the shoulder. That's right, that's right. And what are the two different types of blows that you can get? Um, an anterior force or a posterior force? Yeah, it's, it can further direct it. It can be forced anterior, in which time the metaphysis goes anterior, or the force is directed posterior, in which time that metaphyseal fragment is goes posterior. And those are very rare because they're usually back like this. When you do it, they're usually abducted. So how does the direction of the force uh, affect the pathology of these injuries. Well, an anterior force um, often can you, um, be treated in a non-operative fashion. That's right. Posteriorly, you're concerned about bad stuff back there, so it, you, you may want to... Yeah, the that. anterior, there's really no vital structures anterior to it. And it usually goes just anterior to the sternum. So there really aren't many concerns. There's no significant danger structures in the anterior. Okay, what about the posterior forces? Yeah, there, there's some bad stuff back there. That's right. And we got to worry about the posterior. Yeah, that's right. There are a lot of very vital organs back there. And there's a lot of things that can be injured. The heart, the esophagus, um, the vena cave, I mean the uh, superior um, vessels. And so there are many vital structures in the posterior. So this is one that you really need to be concerned about. So. Let's look at the clinical findings. Anterior, what do you normally see? You'll see a, a probably a palpable bump. That's right. You'll see a palpable bump there, and there's usually 
some pain involved with it, especially with motion of the shoulder. So you, you have, it's easy, you feel this painful prominence. What about posterior, though? They may have some swelling also. Well, yeah, but where's the swelling? Is the swelling anterior or posterior? Uh, posterior. Yeah. And so this is a little bit difficult to tell because usually if it's posterior, you've got a little minor depression, but what is that filled with? Fluid. Uh, fluid, bony. So you really don't feel much in the way of it. And so really you, you go mainly on the fact that they have local pain uh, with movement and they're locally tender there. And so there's some other things, other symptoms that may occur. Uh, facial swelling. Yeah. Difficulty. Well, you have problems with respiration, problems with swallowing, and you also said venous congestion in the face. Those are the things that can occur, secondary changes. So, how do you differentiate the, the anterior from the posterior? You, you, you don't operate on the anterior, you may have to operate on the posterior. So, how do you differentiate it? The the uh, location with comparison to the epiphysis. Yeah, but how, how do you determine that? Uh, usually it's symptomatic if it's posterior. Uh, yeah, concerned about but the what else? You have made the, you have did the history, you've done the physical, you suspect a uh, displacement of the proximal. Oh, imaging? Yes, imaging. Yes, sir. And what's the purpose of x-rays? To, uh, confirm to confirm our physical exam. That's exactly right. That's right. It's, it's to confirm it. Uh, so your exam, it really tells you what's first. Right. And what kind of x-ray are you going to take? Um, well, usually they come in with a chest x-ray if it's a tra uh, trauma. Uh, however, there's um, some particular views like a serendipity. That That's I right. They discuss, so. Yeah. And where did that get that name? Do you know? Are you aware? Yes, sir. It's uh, right here. San Antonio. That's right. Dr. Rockwood, he sent this patient for an x-ray and it was uh, crooked a little bit and he realized then that that was a good way to test it. So you've done a, a serendipity view and it's usually about 40 degrees cephalid. All right, so now you've got this serendipity view. I suppose you take it. So what's the diagnostic criteria for a posterior displaced distal fragment? Usually if it's posterior, you see that head lower that's right. than the other side. Yes, that's right. And so it's usually, the changes may be fairly subtle. It's usually posterior with displacement. And this is the normal side. And so it's a little bit smaller. Why is that? Because it's going to be further away? No, closer. closer. Yeah, closer. Excuse me. It's closer to the, the uh, uh, x-ray film, and so it's not magnified as much as it is on the normal side. So this is a characteristic of the posterior displacement, and that's, you know, you told me why it's smaller. Well, let's look at the other one. The, what's the diagnostic for the anterior? It's usually higher than the that's other right. side. That's right, and the changes, again, are fairly subtle. And the side with displacement, and here's the normal side. Now, what's the relationship as far as size is concerned? That would be larger. That's right, because it's farther away. That's right. The larger is more, and it's more, have a tendency to be cephalid. And, and you see this on this serendipity view. That's characteristic of the anterior displacement. And you told me why it's larger. Okay. Now, you can get the plane changes on plain x-ray. Usually, you don't really see much. Here's one that was posterior, um, but you don't see a lot of uh, really distinct changes. Is there a simpler x-ray view besides the serendipity view? Well, you, what's this view here? This is the lordotic view in which you actually bring the clavicles right out to the in front. And here again, you can sometimes see it. It's not as well de defined, it's not as distinct, but here you can see it. So, since it's very difficult on x-ray, what do you do? How Get do you a can... CT scan. That's right. We're very fortunate in our society that we have the availability of the CT scan. Now, 
Is it really correct to label the fragment as being distal? Mm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. What's the proximal fragment? The, the epiphysis. That's right. That's right, because the proximal fragment is the epiphysis which is still in place. So the thing that descri uh, you describe it, you describe it as the distal fragment, which is the metaphyseal fragment. Now, here we use CT imaging. Is this anterior or posterior? That's anterior. Yeah, you can read. <laughs> Very good, yeah. So it's anterior, that's right. And this is posterior. Here you can see it's a little bit more posterior. All right, what's the treatment of an anterior displaced clavicle if the injury is acute and a closed reduction may be, is a closed reduction beneficial? Maybe. Yeah. So what, how are you going to do this? You got this, you take this patient, do you do it under general anesthesia or do, can you do it in the emergency room? I would do it under general anesthesia. That's right. You, if you're going to do it, you can do local anesthesia injected in the fracture site. You put some local anesthesia there, and then general anesthesia may be a little bit better to control them. And then you, what do you do? Then you apply traction on the That's arm. That's right. And while you're doing that, what else do you do? Hyperabduct the shoulder. Yeah, and what else? Uh, Where is that fragment? Anterior, so you'll so push what do you do? posterior. That's right. You direct pressure is applied over the proximal clavicle. And once you reduce it, you want to stabilize it. So you put a pin in it. Is that right? I wouldn't put a pin in it. You wouldn't put a pin. That's right. No, you don't want to put a pin because uh, it's. And you never want to do it. It's too dangerous. If it's unstable, then you may need to make a little tiny incision, and then actually just go ahead and put some sutures in it to stabilize it with some sutures uh, through the epiphysis and through the metaphysis. Okay. Now, what if it's asymptomatic or late? Then I would probably leave it alone. That's right. Usually they will remodel, go ahead and remodel. And so here's new callus and go ahead and remodel. That's right. So this patient had no pain on movement of the arm. So you leave them alone. And you tell them that they're going to have a bump for a while, but then gradually it will remodel. All right. Now you got you made the diagnosis of a posterior displacement. What are you going to do? Uh, it depends if the patient's symptomatic. Yeah. Well, he, okay, he did it yesterday. So he probably is symptomatic. So what are you going to do? Um, if it's... Uh, and he's also having a little trouble breathing. If it's an acute injury, then that's one that you'd want to take to the operating room for an uh, attempt at a reduction. That's right. So especially if there's symptoms of pressure on the endothoracic structures, a closed reduction should be attempted. But this always requires a general anesthesia. Why? Uh, because of the vascular risk. What else? Uh, and you also need full relaxation. And what else? What, what do you use to pull it forward? Oh, you need to use a towel clamp to yeah, grab the fragment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't like that. Yeah. So, especially you do a surgical prep of the skin and then you apply posterior longitudinal traction. And finally, you reduce the fragment by grabbing it with a towel clip and pulling it anterior. And this is why you need a general anesthesia, because they wouldn't tolerate that if they were awake. At least I wouldn't. So, is it asymptomatic or old? Does, how does that affect the treatment process? If they're asymptomatic or old, often you can just leave them alone. Yes, they would. By that period of time, if they're going to have problems with the endothoracic things, you would already see it. And if they're old, you're not going to move it unless you really open it, and uh, it's it's probably will go ahead and remodel them. So this patient has callus, and again, you leave it alone. So, how do you immobilize them? Well, you use it the same for both. That suture? Yeah. Well, you, you, you've got a good closed reduction and it's stable, anterior or posterior. Just eight. a plain sling? Yeah. Well, actually, you probably use this figure of eight sling. It's about the only place that, as we'll discuss, where I think it's probably a benefit is this figure of eight sling. So, now we're getting into the diathesis of the clavicle. 
and here you can see. Now, what's the general principles of these? Are they complex, serious, what? Generally, they're not a serious uh, That's right. Fracture. There's usually very few problems, yes, sir. and they usually go ahead and heal. And the treatment is usually simple. But what do you need to tell the parents? That they may have a, a cosmetic uh, uh, issue or may, if it goes on to non-union, they may have some pain. Uh, yeah, but non-union is pretty darn rare, rare in yes, children. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, in adults it's a little bit more common. So they'll come in like this with their shoulder forward like this and they look ugly and they, you know, they, every time they move. And what are you, what is the treatment that you do for clavicle fractures? Reassurance. What else? Um, why, why do you treat it? Well, what are you doing with the treatment? Nothing. Well, <laughs> you're doing something. Them. Yeah, you're actually, what you need to tell the parents is that you're treating the symptoms. Oh, okay. Make it easier, more comfortable for them. You have them stabilize the shoulder and you're not going to reduce the fracture. You don't need to reduce the fracture. So, Let's look at the what type of fracture patterns. What do you see in infants? Diaphyseal fractures. Make pardon? Diaphyseal fractures. Yeah, but I mean, how is it displaced and what? Oh. Well, it's usually complete, but there's minimal displacement. And of course, with infants, you have them white fat on their back anyway. So, what if they're uh, one to four years? Those have a green stick. Yeah, more of a green stick, and so they don't have any shortening ball green stick and it's greater than five years you have bayonet opposition you have shortening you may or may not have bayonet being a sub opposition and it's usually a complete fracture here and with bayonet displacement as you can see here so how does age affect the treatment how are you going to treat the infants uh we'll just make sure it heals with a follow-up i know but how are you going to treat it leave it alone. Yeah, you really kind of leave alone. Uh, usually they'll be lying on their back, they're not going to lie on their stomach. And you tell the parents, you don't need to put, a, put them in a sling, do you? No. no. A little baby? No, it'd be kind of hard. There's, if they're one to four years of age, well, how do you treat them? You leave those alone too. Yeah, but how do you treat the symptoms? A sling? Yeah, you can use a sling usually. A lot of people use this figure of eight bandage, which supposedly stabilizes it, but I find that they don't like it. It, it gives them trouble in their axilla, and uh, it's kind of cumbersome, and it really doesn't help, and they do just as well with the sling. In older than five years, you can use this figure of eight, or probably a sling does just as well. So, What's the usual course of treatment? What are you going to tell the parents? How to, you need to tell them ahead of time what they can expect. They can expect for this to heal. Um, I know, but I mean, what are you going to do within the first week? We'll treat their symptoms. Yeah, uh, right. Mostly. And how are they going to be? They're going to be painful. That's right. They're not going to want to move it. That's exactly right. First, they'll have pain with any motion, and they want to use the sling. I had a clavicle fracture once, and I can remember it was real painful that first week. And I could hear it just click as I'd move my shoulder. And the second week, you have less pain, and now they use the sling only during the day. And the third week, what do you see? You should start seeing some callus. Yeah, you usually see callus, and how's the patient? They usually uh, get Well, they don't have any pain. Tomorrow. They refuse to use the sling. <laughs> And they want to get back to their normal climbing tr trees or getting on the bicycle or on the trampoline. Yes, so it's really important that you uh, tell them the first week they're going to hold their shoulder anteriorly. They're going to be painful. It looks badly deformed. And you tell them that's a temporary thing, but that's what they're going to be the first week. And then tell them that they'll get better the second week and the third week. They'll, you're going to have trouble keeping them in the sling. And you need to do this before you start the treatment. And again, you want to tell them that you're not going to reduce the fracture. You're just going to alleviate the symptoms. So, you like to operate. You went into orthopedics to operate? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
When is a more aggressive treatment going to be indicated? I think usually with the Z-type fractures that you see. Well, what about this? That type, yes, sir. Yeah, what's happening here? You've got pressure against the skin. And so what needs to be done in this case? Uh, likely open reduction, internal fixation. Yeah, well, you might be able to do a closed manipulation first and see if it takes the pressure off the skin. Yes, sir. And if it doesn't, then you'll do an open reduction. Okay, and here's following the manipulation, and it goes on to have a good callus, less pressure. Now, how would you manage the fracture in this 14-year-old following being tackled in a football game? He's 14 years old. He was tackled in a football game. Well, there's a lot of controversy here, and there... You know, people are becoming more aggressive in putting plates on these. But here he is. He was managed non-operatively with full recovery of the shoulder motion, upper extremity strength. And so what are the indications for an open reduction? Skin tinting? Yeah. Well, what if it's open? Yeah. Or neurovascular compromise or non-union. That's usually down the road or a pseudoarthrosis congenita. Here again, these usually don't become symptomatic until they're teenagers. Or maintenance of the SSSC. What in the heck is that? SSSC. Something with a soft tissue? So a shoulder no. suspensory complex. Ah, very good. It is a super shoulder suspensory complex. And where do you see that? in polytrauma That's patients. right. You see that you have a fracture of the clavicle and you have maybe a fracture of the glenoid or the proximal humerus that you, you've lost all suspension of this. And so there you need to stabilize. The simplest thing to stabilize is the cl uh, clavicle. It's a little difficult to stabilize the uh, glenoid or the neck of the scapula. So this patient shows up what are you going to do? Uh, would, you, would everybody agree? What did they agree? That's an open fracture. That's right. It's a grade one open fracture. Now, there's a little controversy yet whether all grade one open fractures need to be treated. But it's my experience that if you treat them, um, usually you'll find some dirt there or something like this. And the only thing, the downside of treating them an open grade one is that you have a little bit bigger scar. If you don't treat them, you run the risk of them getting a, an infection, which can be a serious situation. So this is a grade one mid shaft, and you all agree that this probably needs to be open and debrided. Okay, now here's a relative indication for surgical intervention. This is a 14-year-old fell injuring his left shoulder. What do you see here? Skin tinting. That's right, skin tinting. And over the next four days, what's going to happen? Uh, that skin can become necrotic. Yeah, it be, gets red, like it's irritated. So this is his clinical appearance, and the cause of that, you said, is a fragment. And so here he is, like this. Can you accept that? No. Well, you could accept the, the, the fracture position, but you're concerned about what? The skin. That's right, the skin. So it's vertically oriented to a skin fragment. As the swelling subsides, that fragment's going to put more pressure on the skin, and then you run the risk of skin penetration, creating it, converting it to an open fracture. So, how are you going to treat it? Uh, with the go to the OR? Yes. For an attempt for a closed reduction. And then what else, if you don't reduce it? An open reduction internal fixation. With what? The plate. Plate, what else? Uh, a nail. Yeah, you can use a nail or a plate. What's the advantage of, which is better? Well, this is still controversial. If you use a plate, is it better anteriorly or dors or uh, anteriorly or, or proximally? Cephalet, um, open reduction stabilized with a plate and screws. A little bit more involved as far as the problem here. Open reduction and flexible nail. What's the problem with uh, plates and screws if you put it on the cephalad surface? Those if your screw is too long. Oh, well, 
those would be penetrating. Uh, That's right. You can penetrate a vascular system. You can use a flexible nail stabilization or stabilize with a figure of eight. Now, this is what was done. This one had, because he was getting red and looked like he was getting ready to penetrate the skin, first thing you do is you open reduction. And here you can see that vertically oriented mid-shaft segmental fragment. And um, this is a matter of choice. I, I think you with a, a flexible nail, it, it, you have to do less dissection. And what you do is you pass it anti-grade, um, and it's the non-tip side. And so you pass it anti-grade out through the skin, and then you pull it, then the fracture is reduced, and the nail is then passed retrograde under image intensifier, and you put that butterfly fragment back, and it's passed retrograde down to the metaphysis proximally. And it, the, the pin is somewhat bent. And uh, here, you can see that it's passed into the proximal fragment. And the butterfly fragment was secured with wires. Now, here you can see this is the final position. And I have a tendency to bend the tip to prevent migration. The AO people who use this say you don't need to, that it doesn't displace. But I doesn't hurt to bend it, because if it does displace, you're in trouble. And probably it would have been better to use heavy absorbable suture than the, the wires. But you do need to stabilize that. Uh, if it's a, just a simple transverse fracture, you probably don't need to do any like this. Okay, now we're going to talk about a chromioclavicular dislocation. Is that the proper term? Uh, no. No. Again, this is a fracture of the distal clavicle, usually. So what do we pathology we see here? The okay, what about the periosteum? That stays in, intact. intact. That's right. It stays intact in the pediatric age group. You're tearing out the periosteal sleeve. What about the ligaments? You're going to need to repair them? They stay attached to the That's right. That's what's different in the pediatric age group. The failure is through the periosteum and the bone, and the ligaments remain intact, whereas in adults, you need to re do something to repair the ligaments. The ligaments remain intact, and the epiphysis, it usually stays, doesn't displace, and the healing process is that what happens here. You get abundant callus? That's right, you get abundant callus, and it's filled with new bone, and usually then this will remodel, and you'll get essentially back to normal alignment. So, how are you going to diagnose this injury? Uh, clinical exam and x-rays. That's right. First, you have local tenderness, you have swelling and deformity, you have displacement on the x-rays, may have displacement if it's a grade one, you may not. And the patient's got local tenderness there, and whenever you move that distal clavicle, they're painful, but you get an x-ray and you don't see displacement. So what are you concerned about? What else do you look for? Well, there's some other diagnosis that you must consider. This is one that kind of, I got, initially missed the diagnosis. I thought it was a grade one chromioclavicular. It had pain in the shoulder area, minimal displacement. You can see there's a little displacement here. So, we got a axillary view, and what's what what's going on? He has a base of the coracoid. That's right. Fracture. He's got a fracture of the coracoid here, which was causes some instability. So the diagnosis is that he had a fracture of the coracoid. So this is something if you can't see anything on the X-ray, you might want to check this because this will somewhat simulate the symptoms of a fracture of the distal clavicle. All right. What classification do you use? The Rockwood classification. That's right. Use the Rockwood classification. So what's the type one? Pain. And what else? Um, Is it yes. displaced? No, sir. No, it's very almost no displacement, yes, but they have local pain. All right, what about two? Uh, type two is a peri uh, 
periosteal <laughs> sleeve. Yeah, but how much displacement do you have? Less than 100%. Yeah, minimal displacement, less than 50%, really. So, and you're right, that's the periosteal sleeve. And type 3? Less than 100%. Greater than 100%. Yeah, it's greater than 100% yeah. displacement. So a significant displacement greater than 50, or maybe 100 displacement. Well, we got a type 4. What's that? That's the posterior. That's right. And sometimes it can, instead of going strictly cephalad, it goes posterior. And the fragment is posterior, and it's stuck in the supraclavicular joint muscle. And type 5? It's greater than 300. Well, it's usually penetrating the, the muscle, and it lies in the subcutaneous tissue. And the muscle, it's, it is to lie subcontinuous, and it's got marked mark displacement in, in here. And this has been described, but I think it's only in the literature. It's very, very rare. I've never seen it, and I don't think we've seen it here, and I think it's brought in mainly because it lies below the coracoid, mainly because it's described in the literature, but I think that you don't have to worry about this because it's extremely rare, especially in children. So, before the age of 16 years, what are you gonna, what's it depend? Which ones are you gonna treat? Uh, before 16, none of... Well, it depends oh, on the five, type of six. displacement, right? So which ones are you going to treat? Which are displacements? One, two, three, four, five, and four, six? Four, five, and six. Well, non-operatively. Oh, the first Gosh, three. one, two, and three, usually you don't need surgery. Usually you can displace them. Type four, five, and six probably are going to require some surgical intervention. Surgery is usually necessary. And even some type threes may need surgery. It all depends on them patient's activity level and symptoms and so forth. So greater than 16, you use all the criteria as adults. And in adults, it's a ligamentous injury, and you treat the ligamentous injury uh, there. Okay, so here's the patient's day of injury. Look, you can see the displacement. This is not displaced. So what's happening here? This is the injury. There was no definite fracture here, but what would you say is this, a type 1, 2, or 3? That looks like a type 2. Yeah, this is probably a type 2 injury because it's less than, it's about 50%, just a little bit less than 50%. So, how are you going to treat it? Uh, Non-operatively, like with the yeah. sling. And so what's going to happen? What do you see? What's going on here? This is a month later. Is it getting better? Yes, sir. What, why? There's What's, new callus formation. Yeah, that's right. And where is the callus formation occurring? At the metaphysis. Yeah, but where else? Um, and through the... Well, actually, along the periosteum. The periosteum. Your periosteum is intact, and you've got the ligaments are intact, but you've got this periosteal sleeve that's forming the callus. And here's a 12-year-old distal fragment. You can see it here. And this is probably a type 3. You got some early callus, and here's this patient at six months, and now you can see the clavicle is remodeled considerably. This patient happened to be a quarterback for a, a junior high team. All right, here's one. Look how bad that is. And Doc, he's got the potential to be good in sports. <laughs> they all do. So what are you gonna do with this one? You need to operate on this one? He's 16. I mean, he's 14. That's badly displaced, isn't it? Well, let's just follow it. You, you see that this is markedly displaced. So the treatment is, do you repair the torn ligaments? They're likely not torn. That's right. So here he is at three weeks post-injury, and you've got good periosteal callus, and here's this patient at three months. You can see the ligaments are still intact. He had a full range on my shoulder, and the team won the division title. He threw the ball a mile. Huh? <laughs> he threw the ball a mile. That's right. He threw it right, made the winning touchdown. That's right. So you can just watch these. All right. So if you're going to operate on them, what do you need to do? What's the first thing you need to do? 
Oh, you need to have the right operative indication? Is that yeah, the, okay, this is, this is a type three, and this patient is symptomatic, and he's gonna be a high performance. Could be an athlete, but also, he may be a painter or someone that puts plaster and gonna need, does a lot of overhead activity. And so you decide with the type three that maybe you can make him heal faster by operating on him. So if you're gonna operate on him, what do you have to do? Uh, you'll reduce that. Uh, yeah, reduce it first, yes, that's right. You repair the pathology. And do the ligaments need to repair? No, no. that's again, it's emphasized in children, they don't. So at first you replace the proximal fragment into its periosteal bed. And then you repair that periosteal sleeve. Yeah, then. And so usually that doesn't quite hold it, so sometimes you can put a pin in there just to hold it and leave the pin subcutaneous so you can take it out in a couple of days. So that's the way you do it if you're going to treat it. All right, now let's go a little bit more distally, fractures of the proximal humerus. Does the location affect where the fractures are likely to occur? Yes. yes what do you see? When do you see most of the facial injuries? Seven. No, a little bit older. They're usually greater than ten years. What about metaphyseal fracture? They're usually less than ten years. Yeah. And so they're just a little bit different in the, in this. And probably it's related to their activity level. So What's unique about the epiphyseal structure? Well, it's not a true just straight epiphysis, it's kind of a cone epiphysis that you see. It just fits in there like a cone. So, you took anatomy, yeah. So what are the muscles that attach to that proximal fragment and what do they do? All the muscles of the rotator cuff. That's right. And they Teres minor, super infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and the subscapularis attached there. What attaches to the distal fragment? The pec major. Yeah, the pectoralis. And so, what's happened here? It falls into varus. Yeah, that's then. right. Then what about the distal fragment? Is the pectoralis major? It's anterior medial, and here it goes a little bit anterior as well. And this is the force of the pectoralis major. So, how do these heal? Oh. And say this patient is 10 years old. How's it going to heal? What are you looking for? You're for callus formation? That's right. And what guides that callus formation? Um, that periosteal yeah. uh, sleeve. Usually you have a kind of a sharp spike up here that's involved. And if you don't, that doesn't disappear, they'll have impingement syndrome. But in the pediatric age group, you have this proximal metaphyseal spike, but the periosteum guides the formation of this new bone. And usually that spike will go ahead and disappear and remodel so that you'll get full range of motion. And here's most of these fractures can be treated. This was a 12 year old male. Um, and you can see this was a 10 year old male. And you can see three months later, it's got this and at 13 months later, it's completely remodeled. So, you must remember these fractures have tremendous remodeling capacity, but not all of them, and the function and clinical appearance were completely normal. How are you gonna mobilize them? Sling. That's right. Well, what, what, what's this? You ever put one of these on? No, sir. Yeah, this is a so-called Statue of Liberty cast. And the idea was that you would put this on and that you could take the distal fragment and bring it up to the proximal fragment. But you don't want to do this. First place, the studies that did it show that they, they, you really don't hold the displacement very well. And they displace just about equally if you just put them in a sling. The other problem, they usually, usually don't need more than just a sling. The other problem is that you have the elbow like this and it lays down there on the medial side and you there, if it's not well padded and so forth, you can get pressure on the ulnar nerve. So, which of these fractures need operative management? Here again, if you like to operate, right? Yes, sir. Uh, if there's neurovascular injury. Yeah. Well, if they got less than uh, one and a half years of growth. And here's a 
female that's 14 years of age, and this is the date of her injury, and here she is one year later, and she had painful limitation of shoulder motion. Why? Well, because that metaphyseal spike hadn't fully remodeled, and she's 14, so she didn't have complete remodeling. What are you going to do? She, every time she moves, she's so shoulder, she can't do athletics, she I'll has trouble dancing. Just remove that piece superior to the... Well, you can actually bring it back to the correct position. You can take that fragment and move it out, and you can do a proximal humeral osteotomy. But that's a lot of surgery, and so you probably, this is one reason why you sometimes need to be aggressive in a 14-year-old at this age, because there must, may be some simpler surgeries that you can do with less dissection. That took a lot of dissection, you can see. And she's going to end up with a big scar on her shoulder. And when she wears a special dress, she's not going to, you know, people ask her, what happened there? You know. Okay, adults, you need to use their upper extremities for highly competitive activities. Here's a patient that didn't have much displacement. He's a 12-year-old male, was a high-performance baseball player, and here again, he didn't, he lost some motion, and so he was unable to throw the ball. He had to go from a pitcher to an outfielder. So how are you going to manage these surgically? You're going to do an open reduction? A closed reduction and pin it? Yeah, with pins or cannulated screw fixation. Now. What about this patient? Do you think this patient needs to be operated on? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's 12 years of age, and that's a, probably a little bit more displacement, and plus the fact that it's going to take a long time to heal. So, you put a pin like that? Uh, no. No. It's not, you, the pin is not like that. Why? It's not crossing the fracture site. Well, that's one thing. It, it, yeah, it's barely getting the fracture site. It was a type. Um, two Salter Harris fractures. Might be through the fractures. Huh? Is it through the fractures? Yeah. Although that's probably not that much of a. I'm not seeing that be a problem of growth or rest. But what else? What else is it inhibit? What are you putting it? Yeah, you're putting it through the deltoid. Yes, so it's probably not a good idea to do it there. It's probably better to go this direction because you you're not putting it through the deltoid and they can start early motion a little bit. But there's a better way. Here's a 14-year-old fell off the bicycle, and does she have enough remodeling capacity? No. So you're going to treat her. How? Maybe Is there a better way to treat her than putting that pin through there? Maybe cannulated screws for her? Close well, how are you going to do that? You could do that. You, that. That's a little difficult, but you can do that. Is there a simpler way? For the screws? No, oh. to treat this. Stabilize it. Electron traction? Oh, yeah. Huh? Electron traction? Yeah, but then she's got to be in the hospital. Yeah. We don't do that much anymore. We used to do it. A hanging arm cast? Big pardon? A hanging arm cast? Well, you can try that, but that's not very effective. Some people will try it, but it doesn't, in my experience, it doesn't work. Well, if the, this fracture was very unstable, it was reduced in abduction, but when you brought the arm down to this, it's unstable and the reduction was lost. So, what you can do, you can do this. This is what the AO people have recommended, and this is what I've started doing, is that you do retrograde nails, just, just simple incision. You, if you do it on the medial side, you need to make sure that you see the ulnar nerve and you put this on the anterior portion of the distal metaphysis, and you take it up to the fracture site, and you take both pins up to the fracture site, and pass it to the distal fracture line, <clears throat> and then you reduce it with the arm in abduction. The problem with putting the pins angular like this is that you have to hold the arm up in abduction to reduce it, and that kind of um, makes the deltoid kind of compressed, and so it really is difficult to do it. And then when you're trying to get that pin, it keeps sliding off. Whereas this one, it's pretty easy to get those pins in there, and once you get them in, it's a real stable. You can check the stability, 
And you can do this with the arm in abduction, which is the stable position, and then they can start motion. You pass the tip of the nail into the proximal fragment, and you usually have them separated to give you a little bit better rotational alignment. And you need two pins because you need to give some rotational stability. And so that stabilizes the fracture without interfering with the muscle function. So indications for an open reduction, an open fracture, inability to obtain an adequate closed reduction. And here's a 15-year-old male, and he was unable to obtain a closed reduction because of interposed capsule and periosteum. And so this one required an open reduction. Here's a 15-year-old with a closed head injury. And she was actually seen by the orthopedic residents, and they said, well, that doesn't look like it's badly displaced. But this patient had a closed head injury and was kind of spastic. What's your next step to make a determination whether you need to do anything with this? Here's the fracture pattern here. What's your next step? Well, I always get two views. Is that acceptable alignment? Probably not, because he's 15 years old and he's not got that much remodeling capacity. And here you can see that spike is probably going to create an impingement syndrome. But what's the next step? Every time you get an x-ray of an extremity, what do you do? How many views do you You want to get at least two views. Yeah, that's right. So the next step is to get a lateral, a true lateral. And here in the true lateral, it tells you a little bit more. So the message here is that you always get two views to determine how much displacement you have. And unfortunately, that fragment was buttonholed in the deltoid muscle. In this patient, you really can't control him because he's got a head injury. So this is one that you needed to do an open reduction. The patient was thrashing around. The spike had migrated approximately. The fracture pattern, this one would be a difficult to stabilize with retrograde nails because it's length unstable. And so this one would need to be opened, reduced through a deltal pectoral ray, uh, position, and then reduced with screws. And then here you can see the screws to hold it so that they can actually start some early motion and get by with the fact that the patient's still moving their arm around and stabilizing. <clears throat> so now we talk about metaphyseal fractures. Is there a difference in the management of epiphyseal or physeal injuries and metaphyseal fractures? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, there is. And unfortunately, I've looked at the two major textbooks, and they don't really describe that. But there really is an important, it's very important that you differentiate between a metaphyseal fracture and a physeal fracture, because their treatment is completely different. So here's a metaphyseal fragment. What are you going to do with this? I may leave that one alone. Yeah, that's a simple <coughs> sling. So what's different about the muscle forces in the metaphyseal fracture? Well, the, pap the pectoralis is here. But how do moidure fractures in turn the pager group? They usually are just simple green stick fractures and minimal displacement in the permanent sling. They'll go ahead and usually heal very rapidly if they're not badly displaced. Nothing more than a simple sling is needed. So what's the difference between the muscle forces on the tafsio fracture and the proximal physis? This is a proximal physis, and there's no pectoralis to, continue to counteract the epiphyseal rotation. And here on the proximal metaphysis, the fragment is usually not as externally rotated. Why? Well, there's usually a little bit of the, of the uh, pectoralis major attached to that to counteract the rotational forces attached to the epiphysis. So that's the difference. So there's some pectoralis in the proximal fragment to counteract that. So what's the difference in the position? This is proximal physis versus proximal metaphysis. What's the difference? You don't have that rotation through the yeah, head. Yeah, that's right. Here, the distal fragment is usually lateral because you've got angular deformity. And here, it's usually medial because the pe some of the pectoralis will pull it medially. What's the other difference? What's the alignment difference? 
the proximal metaphysis is in valgus. Yeah, that's right. It, you angulate. It's in it valgus. on the rotator cuff? Yeah, it's, it's usually, this is usually angular, whereas metaphysical fragments are usually relatively parallel. So, how are you going to treat this fracture? In a sling. In a sling. But doctor, it's broken. You still think it'll do all right? Mm -hmm. This is why it's different, because with metaphysical fractures, you use it well aligned, you don't have the angular deformity, and here you can see this patient three months later, and then they go ahead and remodel well. So these fractures have remodeling capacities. Now, if it's an older individual and towards skeletal maturity, you may be a little bit more aggressive, or there may be some other reasons, and we'll discuss that in just a minute. So, because nearly all these was nothing more than a sling, that looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Is it broken or fractured? <laughs> <laughs> Well, here it is at three months, and here it is at two years. This was about a 10-year-old patient. So the treatment is, which the fractures have surgical indications? Well, it's certainly an open fracture, but usually that's pretty rare for metaphysical, multiple fractures, or you're not able to maintain an adequate close reduction. And once reduced, how are they stabilized that way? I'd do the retrograde nails. Yeah, again. that's right. Percutaneous stabilization. That's pretty popular, and actually, that's what's described in the uh, recent textbooks. But <clears throat> patients don't like that, and usually that pin sticking out and it gets kind of soupy and so forth. So there's a better method. This patient was thrown for a bicycle, and this patient here had a pretty comminuted fracture. What's the problem here? Is this adequate treatment? Here you can see the lateral view. What are your concern here? Can't control the length. It was stabilized with retrograde flexible nails. What does that control? The angulation. But what else is, is this your concern about this multi-fragment? Uh, length stabilization. That's right. Would you accept the internal fixation structure? No. Why not? You say it's length unstable. That's right. It's length unstable. So what's your next step? How are you going to stabilize the length? With a plate? Yeah, you could do that. That's a lot of dissection, and you've got multiple fragments. Is there a simpler way? External well, fixator? Yeah, that's right. You can use a single screw external fixator, and that will maintain the length. So the pins maintain the angulation, and this maintains the length. And here you can use a simple external, single external fixator, single screw, just to maintain the length. And because you've got internal fixation to control the angulation. And here's one that patient had a distal radial fracture, and so this one, here you have the stabilization. The patient had other fractures in the same extremity, and so this one was stabilized with retrograde nails as well. So this is probably a better procedure if you've got multiple fractures. But if it's just an isolated, you can probably accept and be out of that position. Unless they're uh, getting close to skeletal maturity and you don't have much remodeling capacity. So when you value fractures of the proximal humerus, what hidden injury do you always need to check for? Uh, brachial plexus injury okay. or neurovascular injury. Okay, you've checked them for neurovascular injury and they're okay. What else do you, what other hidden injury are you looking for? Well, you want to make sure that you don't have a dislocation. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe this patient's injury? Is this metaphyseal? Yes. Well, it's a proximal metaphyseal fracture. What else is present? Well, what's going on here? Is that dislocated? You don't know. How are you going to prove it? What are you going to do? Get an axillary review? Yeah. Can, can you do it while he's awake? Uh, no, probably not. Your next step is examine him under general anesthesia. And here you can see it, better images may tell you what you want to know. Your next step. And so, next step, and maybe best to provide some stabilization with this one. Um, and this will allow early motion. So, 
Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions at this point? Okay. So you, you, learn, you learn that you know everything. You don't have any questions. Okay, thank you for participation. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.